Thank you. All right. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody to today's webinar from the Cybersecurity and Information Systems Information Analysis Center, or CISIAC. Uh, my name is Tom McGibbon from the CISIAC. Our presenter today is Chet Hosmer, who I will introduce in a few minutes. Um, before we begin, I, I have a few comments. Certainly, um, all the phones have been muted except for the presenters today. Uh, however, questions can be asked at any time during the presentation by entering them through the Q&A pane or the chat pane in your WebEx control panel. Uh, questions will be answered at the end of the pre presentation, time permitting. Uh, also, another common question is about slides, and yes, copies of the slides will be available afterwards. Uh, you see my email address on the screen. If you would like a copy, please send me an email uh, requesting the slides. Uh, we're recording this webinar, and the video and audio will be posted and uh, at, at some point within the next day or two, and we will, read, we will distribute a link once it is posted. Uh, today, to begin today's presentation, let me just give a brief commercial overview about the CISIAC. Um, as I've said, please note my, um, my email address, but the CISIAC is a specialized technical focal point and information clearinghouse for information assurance, cybersecurity, software engineering, modeling and simulation and knowledge management for uh, the Defense Technical Information Center. Uh, CISIAC is operated by Quantarian Solutions and that's who I work for. Uh, it's funded through this um, Defense Technical Information Center or DTIC, so funding for today's free webinar is provided in part by DTIC. Uh, please make sure to check out our website, www.thecisiac.com. It's also a community of practice. Also, feel free to join us on our LinkedIn discussion groups. We have two discussion groups, one called CISIAC Software Intensive Systems and one called CISIAC Information Assurance. Okay, so at this point, I'd like to introduce our presenter, uh, Chet Hosmer, who is the Chief Scientist and Senior VP at, and co a co-founder of Whetstone Technologies Incorporated. He has been doing research and developing technology in this data hiding, steganography, and watermarking area for over a decade. <clears throat> He's made numerous appearances to discuss the threat steganography poses on numerous radio and TV shows. He's also been a frequent contributor to technical and news stories relating to steganography and has been interviewed and quoted by numerous organizations, including the IEEE and the New York Times. Um, he's also a visiting professor at Utica College. Um, and to top this all off, he has recently um, published a book titled Data Hiding, Exposing Concealed Data in Multimedia, Operating Systems, Mobile, mobile Devices, and Network Protocols. So I think that chat knows something about what he speaks here today. So now I'll, uh, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Chet. Uh, so Chet, please proceed. Great. Thanks, Tom. Thanks for the introduction. I appreciate it. Um, and certainly uh, it's a pleasure being with you guys again. I know we did um, um, a presentation a couple years ago um, in a similar area, but um, there's been some updates and certainly been some activities recently that has um, created renewed interest in uh, data hiding and steganography on uh, the broad international scale. One a little background on what we do here at Wetson Technologies and, and why this is so relevant to us. As Tom mentioned, uh, we've been funded um, initially back in the late 1990s by the Air Force Research Lab and since then by the National Institute of Justice to um, continue to research and develop new technologies related to data hiding in their discovery, detection, mitigation of, of those threats. And part of our job is kind of difficult, which is to collect all of the new methods and technologies related to data hiding and understand them. So as we kind of get started, I want to um, uh, kind of uh, just kind of walk through um, the next steps as we go through what is in fact the evolution and what has the evolution been um, over the last um, 10 or so years and also take a closer look at what's happened just recently. So back in um, 1998, in the beginning of this whole journey, um, the tools that were developed in order to perform data hiding were pretty simple, and they were designed specifically to exploit our senses, whether it was sight, um, whether it was um, our hearing, in order to be able to fool those and be able to hide information. So the objective was to hide information so that if we listen to it or see that information in the normal vein, it wouldn't be able to be detectable. As we, um, as we move forward, 
um, the methods became more resilient to statistical attacks. So as we developed technologies in order to be able to detect those, those that were developing technologies to hide information became more sophisticated and hid information in these um, carrier files, whether they be audio, video, movies, network protocols, in such a way that the statistical variance that we would look at would become less. So it made our job more difficult in being able to um, detect those threats. As we move forward um, in time, multimedia files, specifically video and audio files, became of great interest because they could carry um, much more information than um, the traditional digital images where this kind of started um, out um, had. So we could actually carry significant amounts of payloads within those types of carriers files as we moved forward. Um, as we progressed in time, the, there became a significant interest in hiding information within network protocols, especially things like VoIP and RTP and UDP protocols, and also um, the development of technologies that spread information that was going to be hidden across multiple files in order to make it more complicate, complicated to both detect and recover, and also the use of decoys. In other words, putting files out there that had information hidden in them, but the information that was hidden in them was purposely garbage. So to basically make the, um, uh, the job of discovering the right information um, much more difficult. And then um, a couple of years ago, we started to see the combination of data hiding techniques like Stego embedded in things like um, advanced persistent threats in order to be able to make those um, malware components, especially Trojans and uh, botnets, um, uh, zombies, et cetera, become more permanent fixtures on the machines that they had infected because the type of communication they were using um, was going to not be something that intrusion detection and intrusion prevention systems, data leak prevention systems would be able to, in fact, uh, detect and discover. So moving forward to um, more recently, the developments that from this year, we, we wanted to take a quick look and see what has happened so far this year to give you an idea of the numbers. So we currently track um, new releases of new steganography and new encryption programs, and we um, plot those based on traditional um, platforms like Windows-based platforms, Linux-based platforms, Mac-based platforms. And we also um, are tracking also iOS and Android devices and the release of new technologies there. So just give you a, uh, um, a snapshot over the last several months in 2013. These are the types of um, releases that we've seen of um, new threats that um, um, either mimic old um, methods and technologies and are just new applications or, in fact, new methods. And I'll talk about some of the new methods in, in a few minutes when I get into the uh, discussion about mobile devices and how those have impacted. But you can kind of see that on the steganography side, we've had a good bump, but also on the encryption side, especially recently, we've seen a significant bump in new releases of new technologies that people are using to um, maintain their privacy and keep information um, uh, secure. And what we do with each one of these applications is we analyze the behavior, put it in a particular category, develop methods for detection of those um, on systems so that we can actually provide that information to our customers, whether it's law enforcement, intelligence, defense, commercial, whatever they be. They can um, use our technologies to be able to make positive identifications of these technologies. And in the case of steganography, not only the programs that are being used, but actually the files that contain the hidden content. So uh, the Snowden effect. Um, and, and again, um, uh, based on his release of information about alleged um, surveillance um, activities, um, has basically spurred a, a new interest. Um, since um, his release of information, there's been over 100 new or updated data hiding and encryption programs since the release of information. This is about an order of magnitude larger than we would normally see during that particular period of time. We would normally see during the time that he released that information about 10 to 12 uh, new um, encryption and steganography programs being released, and there are well over 100 that have been released. And I think there's two reasons to um, uh, look at that. One is um, greater interest in um, data hiding and encryption, um, but also, obviously, um, the, the vendors are trying to capitalize on the fact that they could release this information and sell more product. So there's some balance between those two things. We're not naive about the fact that this may be generated by um, capitalism and not just generated by interest from the marketplace. But 
clearly we're seeing a, um, the other side of the coin, which is the interest from the marketplace in downloading these new apps, because um, we track such things as well in order to be able to understand how many people are downloading and using and purchasing those new technologies. So we track that information as well so we can get a better idea of the users and the use cases and how often. We also track how often applications are, in fact, updated. Um, and that's kind of an indication from the market perspective that they have customers and people are using those technologies because they're supporting a base with, with new versions of, of that technology. Some recent encryption releases, these all have occurred just in the, just like a snapshot of the last 30 to 45 days. These are just some of the new encryption program releases that we're seeing. Some of them are um, applications that have been out there before that new versions have been updated, and others are actual um, new applications that have been released in order to capitalize on the, um, on the Snowden effect and the interest in, uh, from the global community in being able to protect the privacy of, uh, of their information as they're using it. So um, we're seeing this uptick that is driven mainly by um, the concerns um, of privacy and information being shared um, and information being surveilled, whether that's true or not. Um, it's not our place to make a comment on that, but we're just looking at taking the thermometer or taking the temperature of what's happening in the marketplace in response to this. And um, based on that, we're seeing um, um, definitely an uptick in new applications and new devices coming out that will do that. So to kind of move forward a little bit, we want to talk a little bit about the emerging threats that we see um, that are not directly related to just the release of new applications, but what we're kind of seeing from the marketplace. I mean, one of the big areas that we're seeing an increase over the last couple of years since the last time I spoke to you guys was um, the, um, the improvements and the increase in mobile device covert communications. So in other words, new applications for Android, iOS, Windows Mobile, BlackBerry um, devices, and new applications for um, data hiding activities on those devices. And, you, and if you haven't looked at this in the past, you may be surprised at the number of apps um, that are available that strictly deal with um, the application of data hiding within those environments. And I'll talk about a couple of those applications just to give you an idea that it's not just the recreation of other methods um, on the mobile platforms, but there's also some innovation that has occurred on the mobile devices um, that um, propose that. On the protocol signaling side, this is where um, uh, folks are using network protocols that tend to be vulnerable um, to the insertion of additional data that doesn't affect the protocol at all, but actually allows signaling to go on. Now, this information from a protocol signaling perspective um, tends to ship small amounts of information you know, over network protocols over a long period of time. The, the next area of APT advancement, the advancement in advanced persistent threats um, within this environment, um, is certainly concerning because um, this is where um, steganography and data hiding methods are incorporated inside malware. And we'll talk a little, I'll give you an example of Shady Rat in a second of how it actually works. But it's an area of, of great concern because um, many of our defenses that we have, whether it again is the data leak protection, intrusion prevention, um, you know, obviously antivirus, anti spyware kinds of things, don't necessarily address information that was hidden inside other objects that are being moved across our network, whether those are images, audio files, videos, whatever they happen to be. So we're not exactly looking for those kinds of things and peeling back the onion of every image, every audio file, every video that's being moved around to determine if there's something hidden inside of it. So um, that, that's a concern. Um, obviously, the, um, the exploitation of data structures, um, for example, data structures that are included in large files for example, multimedia files, and those data structures can be exploited in order to hide significant amounts of information in those carrier files without actually um, affecting um, the actual viewing of the video. And I'll give you an example of that in a couple of minutes and, and show you how that actually um, uh, works and how effective um, it actually is. So talking about Operation Shady Rat for just a moment, um, something that kind of got the attention of um, uh, folks around the world uh, that were concerned about um, uh, information being leaked out of the organization, and more importantly, how was that information being leaked? And how, in other words, how was this done? So Operation Shady Rat was originally discovered by McAfee researchers um, as they were um, examining systems. So the Shady Rat um, was a massive advanced persistent threat 
that um, has been going on worldwide, and it existed for over five years before it was detected. So this has resulted in the leakage of intellectual property from over 70 government agencies, international corporations, nonprofits, and 14 different countries had been affected. So it was a very targeted attack. In other words, it wasn't a mass attack that everybody was getting this threat. It was actually targeted at specific individuals and specific organizations, but the whole point was for it to persist over a long period of time. Um, which kind of raises it to the level of an advanced persistent threat where the techniques were advanced of how they were actually keeping their information hidden and they wanted to be able to maintain that persistence over a long period of time. Um, the attack employed <clears throat> steganography for hiding malicious code or um, and, and data behind image files. We'll talk a little bit about how that works and I'll kind of walk you through um, that process with a little um, a mini anim animation that I put together. So. What was the anatomy of Operation Shady Rat? In other words, how did it actually occur? Well, it was pretty straightforward. Um, as with most attacks, um, uh, the attackers sent emails to individuals that, the, um, um, that they were interested in targeting. So they had gathered reconnaissance information about certain individuals that knew worked in certain locations that they were interested in um, um, leaking information out of. They sent them those email messages. And um, inside the email was a legitimate spreadsheet that contained contact information that were, in some cases, related to a conference or people that they knew. So that when they opened up the Excel spreadsheet, it looked like a legitimate data. But in the background, of course, what was happening is um, the victim's computer um, uh, was being infected with um, a piece of malicious code, basically a Trojan that was then infected on their machine. So everything up to that point looked normal to the user. Even the content of the data that they received appeared legitimate. Um, and obviously they didn't recognize that information um, from the perspective of a Trojan got installed you know, on their desktop machines. At that point, once the Trojan was on the machine, what it would do is it would go out and reach out to the update site. Um, and it did this over the web, so using protocols like HTTP in order to be able to go out and retrieve information from, in this case, the command and control organization. But that information, instead of actually coming in the form of a command and control protocol, it actually came back to them in the form of an image. So all they did was reach out to a website, download an image, and inside that image file was the command and control and potentially updates to the actual Trojan itself so that it could self-modify itself in order to improve. So once that was made and that, was, that contact was made and additional information was gathered by the Trojan, um, it was now on the machine and information could now be leaked by the command and control sites now using command and control data, some of the same methods using steganography to communicate command and control information and retrieve information back. And because it was done this way, the network defenses that we typically have in place that would uh, defend against something like this uh, were rendered useless, at least at the time, because um, the information that was being leaked and the, and the command and control information that was being sent was being sent via images that were um, on legitimate websites that were being accessed by um, the Trojan that was installed on that machine. Um, there are some systems in the world today still affected by Shady Rat and still leaking information out. Um, the next area we want to talk about was steganography and smartphones. Um, I wrote an article a couple years ago, um, actually a little over a year ago now, uh, for DFI News. It's out there on the web. That's the link. It'll be in the PowerPoint. So if you want to go read that article, you're welcome to um, do so. And it kind of covers some of the things that we're going to talk about now. But this is just a snapshot of my um, uh, one of the pages on my iPad. And these are just some of the applications, just a small snapshot of the applications that are available um, on iOS, um, on either smartphones, in other words, um, an iPhone or an iPad or a mini iPad, whatever you have, in order to be able to perform uh, many different types of data hiding from a steganography perspective. This doesn't cover the encryption programs. This is just a small set of the uh, stego programs that are out there that you can use and download. They're, they're labeled as steganography programs. They're labeled as data hiding programs. Um, Apple doesn't do anything to prevent those. These are legitimate applications that you can download, but they actually are there for one purpose and one purpose only in order to be able to hide information and conceal information and perform covert um, communications um, activities you know, within that environment. So um, let's take a look at just a couple of these just to kind of give you a sense of how they operate and how easy they are, in fact, to use. So one of them is a, an application called SpyPix, and what you do is you um, either take a photograph with your phone and um, uh, 
create a decoy image. In other words, what's the image you're going to hide information in? And then you basically can hide an image. Now, the advantage of hiding an image from a smartphone, for example, is not only could I write on it, I could do whatever I wanted to hide the information within the other image, but I also can take a snapshot of my screen. So if I have a decoy image and I have information that's, let's say, company proprietary um, or something that I want to snap, all I do is take a photograph of my screen using my phone and then take that image of what, whatever is on my screen and embed it in the decoy image and then email that decoy image out. Um, so very simple, easy to use application. Anybody can use it that um, has a sixth grade education in order to be able to use this technology in order to be able to communicate um, images um, through um, the environment. Another application um, allows you to basically um, hide information, um, and you can hide two different types of information with Pegasus. Um, one type is obviously just text messages that I want to be able to, again, hide within an image. In this case, it's a picture of uh, the beach that I took in Myrtle, um, where I live today. Um, and um, it basically, I'm hiding a text message with inside that image, and then again, I'm going to either MMS or message that image or email that image. But also, you can actually hide a recorded message. So in other words, part of this application is to be able to say, I want to be able to record my voice and record a message, and you can do that and hide that within the image and send it out, which is kind of a, um, an interesting twist. So very easy to use the phone to basically hide information within those kinds of images. One of the more advanced methods is something called an acoustic picture transmitter. And so in this particular application, what they've done, and this is one of the innovations that we've seen come out of the smart mobile market, is the concept of taking an image and turning it into an audio, and then taking that audio and hiding it inside an actual audio clip. So basically what this does is takes your photograph and digitizes it and turns it into spread, spread spectrum audio that actually can then be um, exchanged. And so if you listen to the audio, it, it seems meaningless. But if you have the proper um, recovery program or the decoder, it will actually convert the, um, um, the acoustic digitation of the, of the picture back into the photograph itself so you can recover the data um, at the end. So again, many different methods are being tried to hide information and um, obscure it so that it looks harmless within these environments, but, and, and more innovations are happening um, you know, every day. As we kind of move forward to talk about multimedia data hiding, um, I want to talk about um, an application that, um, uh, that's been pretty popular because of, of what it does. And it allows you to hide information within um, a movie, within um, you know, a multimedia file like the one that's here. So if I were to actually um, play this video, this is just um, a clip that we cut out of um, the Dark Knight movie. That's, um, sorry about that. That is um, about... Um, uh, three minutes long, and I won't bore you with the whole three-minute clip. So all we did was we took the movie, and we cut out a three-minute clip of the movie, uh, Morgan Freeman walking to the wall, um, and doing this. And we wanted to basically hide some additional information using TC Stag into um, uh, this particular video. So I'm going to stop this for a second and uh, uh, exit out of this and kind of show you how this actually um, works. Sorry, I've got to move some of this stuff around. Give me one second. So again, this is the movie that um, I'm dealing with, and sorry. So if I double click and bring this up as a movie, obviously it just plays you know, as normal as you just saw from within the, within the PowerPoint. But how TC Stego work, TC Steg works is it actually incorporates the capabilities of TrueCrypt, which is a fairly well-known encryption program that has um, a unique feature, which is to be able to um, uh, take the hidden container within um, uh, um, a TrueCrypt volume and actually hide it inside of this video. So what I'm about to do sort of makes um, no sense. I'm going to select the file. In this particular case, I'm going to select that Dark Knight movie that was on my desktop as the TrueCrypt volume. And this sort of makes no sense because why would I mount a MPEG file as a TrueCrypt volume because TrueCrypt has their own format, obviously, and it's, that's not the format of a movie. So if I go ahead and try to mount this, and I'll type in the password that I've used to protect this particular um, um, object, and it accepts it. So the TrueCrypt application, this encryption program, has now successfully mounted the, um, uh, the MPEG movie that I just played for you as a TrueCrypt volume. If I go into that volume and look at it, it actually shows me what was hidden in there. And if I go into the video section, so in other words, if I wanted to look at some video that was um, incorporated within that, um, 
that movie. So now we have this MPEG movie that has a TrueCrypt volume, which is encrypted, that's hidden inside that movie. And inside that TrueCrypt volume are other movies. For example, I can play um, this movie, which is just a short NASA clip um, of the flyover of uh, uh, Australia uh, during um, the Northern Lights. So we are able to hide an encrypted volume inside a movie that has high definition content and a significant amount of it. Basically about 100 megabytes of information was hidden inside this movie with, um, with no impact um, on the video, the original video of, that we had created you know, from it. So everything looks normal. And obviously if I dismount this particular movie and come back and play it for you again, um, the movie plays just fine. So um, it's um, something that um, it certainly was startling and concerning to a lot of different folks about the, the amount of information that could be hidden in a simple movie. And obviously, movies are pushed around the internet all the time. And um, significant amounts of information can be hidden in them without affecting the actual playing of the movie itself. So again, some recent examples, and I've covered most of this, um, except maybe the protocol section, of talking about some of the different applications that exist now to be able to perform the hiding. And it is much more voluminous than it has been in the past, especially based on now the integration of video um, data hiding, as well as the introduction, introduction of applications that run on the plethora of smart mobile devices that we have out there now, which obviously outnumber desktops. So um, the ability for people to covertly communicate whether they're inside an organization, in other words, if it was a bring your own device to work scenario or the actual corporate um, environment to be able to um, utilize that technology is certainly of concern to everyone. On the protocol side, we see um, advancements being made in um, integrating um, technology into VoIP and into Skype silence areas in order to be able to hide information you know, within, um, within those environments as well. So what are the applications of these different technologies today, and how are they used by um, uh, folks that are trying to um, covertly communicate or hide information within these carrier files? Obviously, on the mobile side, we see it being used for two specific purposes. Um, one, for the conveyance of small payloads, whether it happens to be a screenshot or a short message being communicated, and also for covert communications between different operatives. We, we see that happening a lot more today, so that um, information that's being communicated with people appears to be more innocuous, but in fact, information is being hidden in it. From a structural perspective, as we saw within the MPEG movie, in attacking these larger um, uh, carrier types and embedding information for data leakage, and that data leakage obviously can be massive. Even in a single short movie clip, we can hide as much as 100 megabytes of information, which has really only been possible over the last couple of years. From an APT perspective, this is a versatile set of payloads that are there in continuous data leaks. So the concept behind APTs and using Stego is I want to be able to leak information out of that organization over a long period of time, uh, potentially many years, not just many days or many weeks. So the APT implementation of these types of techniques is really there for that continuous data leak operation. From a protocol perspective, the, the applications there are either signaling um, the conveyance of small pay payloads or for signaling. Um, and key exchange. So the concept is, is that one of the problems, as you all probably know, about encryption is how do I update my keying material? So these protocols, since they can carry small amounts of information in each packet, are being used to be able to um, exchange new keys so keys can be refreshed in the field by operatives that are out there um, in, in, in that model. So what are some of the mitigation strategies that um, we're employing and other folks are doing, and I kind of tried to break this down into three different categories, short-term, mid-term, and long-term. So the things that we're doing right now today kind of fall in the, uh, the short and mid-term, and then we're looking at and developing new strategies for the long-term. So in the short-term, we're doing what you would expect, right? We're application blocking or blacklisting the um, applications that shouldn't be allowed to be used within the corporate environment, for example. Um, and not allowing those applications to run on those devices, whether those devices be desktop workstations or whether those devices be um, mobile devices um, and integrating technology into those in order to block those. Obviously, for discovery and forensics, so after the fact, postmortem, we have something. We're looking for those applications and looking for the associated files that could have had information hidden that could be relevant 
that in fact could be relevant to the case that we're investigating. And also doing non-destructive jamming. So in other words, if we take a carrier like a movie or um, an image, since we understand how the information is being hidden within those, if we don't try to detect it, but instead what we do is go out and actually modify it without, but still rendering the video or the image or audio file still useful, um, we can actually perform jamming to um, um, uh, make that um, process um, worthless to those that are trying to perpetrate it. In the midterm, um, we're um, implementing techniques with some of the major vendors that are related to live discovery. So email and web gateways, host and network DLP applications that are out there, we're integrating these technologies of, of blocking and jamming uh, specifically into those applications so that we can actually catch this at the borders of our network um, and um, alert folks when we're seeing activity that is related to either the leakage of information or data hiding or the use of ap certain applications. Um, from a long-term perspective, um, we're looking at things like trusted data structures, in other words, to shore up the data structures that we use for these popular um, applications, um, developing better trusted protocols. I mean, when we looked at IPv4 versus IPv6, some of the same um, problems in, um, for data leakage in IPv6 still exist. Um, they didn't fix any of those issues in the protocol that we had seen for years in IPv4. Um, signed content, um, content provenance, so in other words, embedding information within um, carriers of legitimate data that provide provenance of that particular information so that we can actually track it um, um, through its life cycle um, from that perspective. Um, Tom mentioned um, graciously at the beginning about the book that uh, I co-authored with Mike Rago from Mobile Iron. Um, to um, kind of give you an idea of what's in the book, because um, it obviously dives much deeper into um, the subjects that I've mentioned here. But um, obviously we cover um, image-based iconography for all the different image types and how it's done and how you can get some of that. We cover multimedia data hiding, um, even provide you with um, certain applications that you can use to be able to discover information hidden in things like MPEG files. Um, Android methods, in other words, what are the standard methods? And we, we analyze several of the Android programs and how they actually work, and certainly we think we've um, focused on the more sophisticated one. The same thing for iOS, uh, whether it's um, iPhone or iPad, those applications that run in that environment. We've also taken a look at a whole set of applications um, and technologies that are used to hide information within operating system data. Um, there are several out there that also include file system um, data hiding um, applications. Virtual machine methods, um, in other words, how information is being hidden within virtual machine structures uh, that can be passed around since those are traded and exchanged all over the place today for a variety of purposes. Um, network protocol and data hiding, I mentioned a little bit that. We obviously dive into that pretty deeply um, in the book. Anti-forensic technologies and how um, some of these technologies are related to um, making it more difficult for those to investigate and to, um, um, to discover information you know, in legitimate um, investigations. Talk about mitigation strategies, in other words, how we actually are going to deal with this now and in the future. And um, that's it. So I wanted to open it up for any questions that um, folks might have. Um, that's my contact information on the screen. So um, please um, be feel free to also, as Tom mentioned at the beginning, um, you can email him or you can also obviously email me if you have any specific questions about this um, or um, have interest and I can hopefully provide you with some, uh, some background. Okay, well, um, thank you, Chet. Um, very excellent. Um, I actually don't, let's see, I don't have any questions uh, right now, uh, but what I wanted, to, I, I have a question I want to ask, but before we do that, uh, we're doing something a little bit different. We're going to do a poll right now because we're trying to, would like to get some feedback on our webinars. So if I could ask John to, um, to do the poll, uh, I'd appreciate it. Well, anyways, I think it will happen in a minute here. Um, but let, let me ask my let me ask my question. Um, so, based on the recent events, such as the Snowden event, uh, Chet, what do you see as the future of related to privacy, uh, related to affecting the use of encryption technology and steganography? You know, Tom, I think that there's there's a couple things. One, it, it, there may be a positive out of this where. Uh, more people that are um, have important things that, that they need to protect, uh, legitimate important things they need to protect, will start using um, technology that's been on the books for um, 
you know, well over a decade or more in order to be able to be more conscious of uh, using technologies that can protect those communications on the legitimate side. On the illegitimate side of folks that are trying to communicate um, information covertly, uh, trying to leak information out of organizations, I think they will also gravitate more to doing that in a more protected way as we move in the future. And, and we see, like I said, the, the immediate spike from the Snowden incident and other things that are happening in the world today uh, continue to um, drive um, new technology and certainly make our job more difficult in keeping up with all of the new applications and understanding both how to discover and detect those, um, but also potentially how to jam or mitigate some of those um, those activities. So we see that increasing as people come become more concerned about um, their communications being private and certainly on the criminal and worse side of the coin, um, those folks using techniques that are going to impede law enforcement. I mean, our, I, I talk to our law enforcement customers almost every day, and certainly their concern is what impact is this going to have on their ability to be able to prosecute crime if more and more people move to using more sophisticated methods in order to be able to um, um, hide um, their information, to conceal what they're doing, to cover their tracks. And those are of great concern to law enforcement, not only here in the United States, but, but worldwide. So I think the effects um, uh, from this and from some of these recent events and the publicity they have um, received are certainly going to drive new technologies. And some of that is good and some of that is going to make um, um, investigations and prosecutions certainly um, more difficult um, and certainly has made my life more complicated. Yeah, for sure. Uh, that's good. Uh, we do have a couple of questions that have come in now. Um, well, actually, I have a question. I, while you were talking, I was on my iPhone. Try, I couldn't find some of these apps that you were talking about. Are those um, iPad apps only? Because uh, there must be other some apps of, for the. Most of them are both. Most of them work um, uh, on both iPad and iPhone. But uh, um, you, you, you go to the App Store and you type in steganography, and you'll see those. And I think there is obviously a different set that is available for iPad, but obviously all the um, iPhone apps will work on iPad as well. Right. Um, I was doing that on my iPad, so some of those might have been iPad exclusive. But yeah. They're all right available from the store, and the same thing. I didn't show the, all the ones from the Google Store as well, um, but there are, you know, hundreds. Um, there seems um, to be tons Google. of them I, I was noticing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. there seems to be. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, here's the first question. Uh, in the past, we used to call hiding objects and JPEGs and BMPs, Easter eggs. Is that term still used? Yeah, that, that was kind of, that's from a digital perspective, that's one of the things that's where it actually started. And um, as the technology um, uh, moved forward, um, I started working in this area in uh, 1998. Um, and uh, from there, we the term steganography was, was more broadly adopted um, for the hiding of information from a data hiding perspective. And, and as we move forward to today, we tend to talk about this more from a data hiding perspective because um, it now um, spans not only um, hiding from the perspective of steganography, but also data hiding techniques and privacy techniques have evolved into um, a whole set of technologies um, that are not only what, what the purists would call steganography, um, but um, uh, techniques that basically obscure data and also um, secure data. Okay, okay. Um, this one person wants to know, have you also seen vulnerability, vulnerabilities in the newer car's infotainment systems that may lead to unwanted surveillance or control of the vehicle? Um, definitely. Um, that's, that's a terrific question. We are definitely seeing that. Obviously, um, uh, one of the first areas of attack that we're seeing is obviously on the Microsoft-driven um, uh, platforms that, that have sync in them. Um, and, and those have incredible control of what's going on. And we've seen um, modifications of the navigation system. We've seen people hack in and basically change playlists. And since your phone is connected into those devices as well, uh, being able to access your phone and your contacts through sync, for example. Um, and so um, we have, I haven't seen any specific um, attacks that actually take control of the vehicle in, uh, in some other ways. But I have seen manipulations of the navigation system and manipulations of um, other things that are in the connected devices that are connected to sync, for example, um, in those environments. And we're going to definitely see um, more of that as we go forward because um, 
obviously those platforms are just as vulnerable as the phones and the uh, smart mobile devices and the desktops since they're running essentially the same operating systems that have been traditionally attacked. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Um, so one person wants to know, wants to know, are there Android apps also? Yeah, there are well over 150 that we have currently tagged just on the steganography side, and there are more on the encryption side. And those are some in the third party as well as in um, direct in Google Play and the, um, the Android apps that are in the stores. So um, Android is a little bit different because you, you can buy, you know, um, you can obtain third party apps um, more easily than you can on the iOS platform, but um, there are um, hundreds that we're tracking just for the Android platform, and now as mobile, Windows Mobile um, has taken over almost 4% of the market, um, within um, for the Windows Mobile device, um, we're seeing a lot of applications starting to move into the Windows Mobile as well. So it's not strictly related to iOS, and I certainly didn't mean that in my briefing. I just didn't include the Android stuff because I thought mm -hmm. it was redundant. But um, Android, um, Windows Mobile, BlackBerry all have apps that um, can perform some of these operations, and um, so any one of those could contain uh, those kinds of um, those kinds of apps. All right. Okay. Um, this one person asks: Wouldn't hashes hashes of an image prior to any embedding of messages preclude the addition of messages? Yeah. Um, one of the ways that that's done is um, either through um, hashing or watermarking of an image, for example, or um, some other uh, digital media. Obviously, we have DRM technologies, digital rights management capabilities that can protect um, those. The problem is, is they're very rarely used. They only tend to be used by those that are trying to protect the copyrights of those images, audio files, videos, and they're not done um, uh, traditionally um, in, a, in a consistent basis um, when you're creating that content inside an organization, because then you could actually just check the markers to determine that that, um, that object, as it was exiting the network, hadn't been um, altered in any way to contain data. So um, that is uh, one of the best methods that we recommend folks when they have um, that kind of content um, to apply the DRM kinds of technologies to them and then check those at the borders to make sure that nothing is leaking out that isn't um, been legitimately signed in, in, in or watermarked um, to um, uh, contain that information. So it, it's, a, it's, a, it's one of the mitigation strategies and techniques that are out there that we're recommending, but um, I can only say that how rarely I have seen it in practice. Oh, I see. Okay. <clears throat> have you ever found malware targeted, targeted at purchasers in the STEG programs for iPad, iPhone, or Android? <laughs> um, yeah, um, obviously when uh, – um, when you're dealing with this kind of content, regardless of what you're downloading and from, um, obviously the Trojanization of those kinds of applications is commonplace. Uh, yeah, um, it's so, possible, right? Yeah. Yeah, because the, 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 there are applications that people are interested in and using, and then the Trojanization of those to be able to do other things is pretty commonplace. I would say more commonplace on the Android platform um, because it doesn't go through as much rigorous testing, and it doesn't mean that iOS is better than Android by any stretch of the imagination, but rather their process tends to be a little bit more rigorous in being able to um, detect that, although one of the most popular apps on the iPhone over the years had been the Flashlight app, which was a fairly um, worthless flashlight as far as I was concerned, but it was actually a tethering app that was embedded in the flashlight. So um, um, Apple's not perfect either in being able to catch those hidden application capabilities within there. There was some work done at um, George Mason University. I presented there a couple of months ago, and it's on the web, so you can go to GMU and find the presentation. But they were talking about new methods for at least mobile devices um, that could detect behaviors within apps based on, for example, things like power consumption um, during an app running that would be unusual for an app that was, you know, made to be a calendar but was actually doing other things because it was using GPS data, it was using um, other uh, mechanisms, and you could detect that the application was doing things that it wasn't authorized to do based on the power that it was drawing. So great presentation, and it's out on the GMU web website if uh, somebody wants to look at it. It was, it was really interesting to me of yeah. how people are, new innovative methods of people detecting after doing things that they weren't intended to do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, should the newer data hiding techniques give companies pause before transition to cloud computing environments? 
I think that um, they should give everybody pause because I think you know what I've been trying to promote over the last several years is for us to look at the underlying problem, and, and I think that's why I, I, I always thought that this talk was relevant to um, initially the DAX and now to um, SISIAC, is that it's all about um, the concept of us looking at the data structures that we use for holding our information and the protocols that we're using and look at them from a security point of view and look at data hiding um, in those carriers, whether it's a network protocol, an image, an audio file, a video, those data structure needs to be need to be considered for the ability to protect them from being um, vessels for hidden information. And I think that's where the technology has to go, especially in the long term, is developing better data structures and better protocols that would be resilient to um, hiding of information within those protocols. And certainly, cloud is the place to start. Um, in order to be able to um, consider the fact that data hiding within the cloud is happening and will happen and, and recognizing the awareness that is there in order to be able to um, protect against it um, uh, in the future. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are there any telltale signs of steganography going on? I mean, when you receive stuff other than someone sending you a Batman video for no reason at all? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, typically um, the the people that are receiving and sending those know they're coming, right? They're coming, right? Um, right. Yeah. Well, one of the one of the investigative <laughs> techniques that um, that we use is that um, in many cases there are still, in fact, a lot of dumb criminals out there. And if you get an image that um, seems suspicious to you, one of the quick things you can do is Google the image, because typically um, criminals are also lazy and they'll go pull the images from Google Images and use that as the carrier file. So if you can find the original and then you have um, the one that's been altered, you can actually um, do an easier job of being able to detect that and also potentially extracting the hidden information can can be useful. So, um, you know, th there's some simple things that you can do if you um, uh, see that because what you're looking for is an image that, for example, let's take images. You're looking for an image that looks exactly the same, that's at the same physical dimensions, um, but doesn't look any different. So it's almost like you're looking for no change instead of looking for a change. So the question would be if I have two images that um, look exactly the same but have a different hash, um, are the same physical dimensions, what else would cause that? Um, except for the hiding of in, um, um, illegitimate information within that image, right? Right. Because even if you do um, some sort of image processing on that image, you're going to see a visual change, right? I'm going to crop, I'm going to blur, I'm going to sharpen, I'm going to change the contrast, the color, the brightness. Those things are going to be visually different. But if I get two images that are exactly the same, right, in look, size, dimensionally, and but they, but they um, have different hashes, the question that I always ask is why is that? And then mm -hmm. investigate further. Okay, okay. Um, I think the final question is, do you have the blacklist application document reference? Um, yeah, one of the products that we obviously provide at Whetstone is a, um, a tool that will, um, I'll call it StegoHunt, that will actually, that includes all of our blacklists, which is right now between encryption and um, steganography is well over 3,000 applications that are in our library just for those two um, data sets. And we have those, and we, we either provide them in our products or there's multiple companies out there that license the blacklist from us to integrate into their own applications. So, for example, if they're using um, McAfee and they want to integrate you know, these um, blacklisted items, we obviously license those and then provide updates on a monthly basis for the blacklisted um, uh, programs that are within, I think we have 23 different categories today, but the two that are of interest for this talk would be the encryption in the um, in the steganography data sets that we have. Okay, okay. Um, well, it appears that that's all the questions, Chet. Uh, again, I'd like to thank you very much for uh, giving this presentation. Uh, your, yours are always interesting presentations, and then we get a lot of uh, good feedback. So appreciate your your, your giving giving this for us and uh, taking your time uh, with us. Yeah, no problem. I really appreciate you guys having me, and I hope that. Um, um, I appreciate all the questions. I thought they were great. And also, you know, hopefully this just provides some uh, um, additional awareness to folks and interest in um, sharing this data with everybody. Hopefully we'll, we'll make us all um, a little safer in the future. Right. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody, for attending. And uh, we will uh, be having another webinar next month sometime. So stay tuned for that. Thank you.